Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and we're continuing our interview with Gregory Wilpert about the situation in Venezuela. Gregory joins us in the studio. He's the founder of VenezuelaAnalysis.com. He's the author of Changing Venezuela by Taking Power, the History and Policies of the Chavez Government. His wife is the Venezuelan Counselor General in New York, and he's about to become the head of English Telesur, which will be based in Ecuador. So you're, you'll be heading down to Quito soon. Yes. And uh, we discussed all of that in part one, at the beginning of part one of the interview. So if you want to, I'd suggest maybe you watch part one, which is a little bit more about the politics and the political situation of Venezuela. This, this part's going to be more about the economic situation. So in terms of the protests and such, uh, whether they're taking advantage of the situation or whatever, there is a real economic problem. So first of all, describe where things are at right now in terms of inflation, cost of living, and, and some of the other issues related to that. Well, the inflation figures for January just came out, and they were at, uh, it was measured at 3.3%, which is still very high. If it were at an annualized rate, it would come to over almost 40%. So that's an extraordinarily high rate uh, of inflation. Last year, uh, for 2013, it was 56%. Uh, and shortages in Venezuela are actually also quite dramatic. Uh, and they went up, actually, in between uh, November and January. That is, uh, previously, the central bank measures uh, shortages as a percentage of how many of the basic goods cannot be bought in uh, any given store. And they found previously it was around 20%. And I think December, January, it was around 28%. Uh, so it, things have gotten uh, and, 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 uh, uh, kind of bad in that sense. And, and d there's just no way that workers' wages would be keeping up with this. They do, actually. Are, mean, they, they, are they pegged to inflation? Many times, yes. Uh, not always, but in many cases they are pegged to inflation. And then there's the informal uh, labor market, which uh, also essentially pegs uh, their income also to, uh, to inflation because they can charge whatever prices they want uh, in, in the street, you know, street vendors and so on. But for example, do government jobs automatically do, do raise, rise in, in, in relation to inflation? Not always, um, but uh, in most cases they do, yes. And that it, it, if it weren't, uh, Venezuela would, would become the most unequal country in Latin America, as a matter of fact, it has, because, it, because uh, it is a peg to inflation, not automatically, as I said, but usually a, as a result of negotiations. And in fact, the recent numbers were, in fact, Venezuela is one of the most equal countries exactly. in Latin America. Exactly. Um, and that's because, you know, especially also the, the uh, minimum wage is practically pegged to inflation. It's not, again, uh, it's, a, it's the president's decision, but uh, they, as a practice, they always uh, adjusted by at least as much as inflation was in the previous period. So, so then still, as you say, there's not enough food stuff available. There's well, shortages. I wouldn't say uh, th there's a distinction I think one has to make between shortages and not, not enough food. Er Venezuelans still eat incredibly well. Uh, I mean, if you look at you know, the amount of calories that Venezuelans consume between uh, you know, when Chavez first came into office in 1998, it was around 2,000 calories per person per day, and now it's uh, closer to 3,000 calories. Uh, I mean, so they're eating a lot more and a lot better than they did. Uh, so just because you, know, you can't find, let's say, butter one day or milk one day doesn't mean you're going to eat less that day. Uh, uh, so that you have to make a distinction. A distinction. It's not like people are going hungry in Venezuela. That's uh, it's certainly not the case. Uh, but it is a frustrating experience if you do want to. I mean, recently an opposition blogger made the comment that, that she couldn't bake a cake. Okay, <laughs> perhaps you can't have cake that day, uh, but you can have some cookies, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, so so that's not really the issue. Uh, the issue is really the frustration level that uh, that goes with these shortages and the long lines. Uh, that's really the main problem or the main uh, uh, reason that people go out on the streets. But, but there must also be sections of people that do not have their incomes pegged to inflation, whether they're on, uh, retired or they're in workplaces that simply they don't have those kinds of agreements. Right. So there if, are, if your wages are being deflated by 56 percent, that's a lot, or 40-something percent. Yeah, there are certainly sectors that, uh, where it isn't, but it's, it's really a, a minority sector in Venezuelan society. So, so why is there such a problem? I mean, Venezuela has, I think, now the worst inflation in Latin America. Yes, well, even in the world, actually. Um, and uh, it, it has its historical reasons, and it has uh, reasons that are specific to the Bolivarian Revolution. The historic reasons is that Venezuela actually has had a problem with inflation already ever since the early 1980s. As a matter of fact, in the 1990s, inflation averaged uh, back then already 50% per year. 
Uh, so uh, actually during the Chavez government, they got it down to 22% on average per year, ex with the exception of the past year. So uh, it has been a problem, and th the reason for that really has to do with what's called the Dutch disease, that Venezuela receives a lot of an influx of, of petrodollars uh, that uh, basically uh, come into the economy and raise the level of wages and raise the level of prices uh, in, in a way that, uh, that, that heats up inflation. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's, that's really a persistent problem that a petrol-based economy uh, normally suffers from. And the big question is how do you deal with that? And um, there's a number of ways that the government has tried to deal with it. And another, one of them is to, to uh, is, uh, is, uh, has to do, also one of the problems has to deal with the fact that Venezuela is trying to um, uh, establish a transition towards a socialist economy, uh, which develops its own kind of problems given that Venezuela exists in a global capitalist market economy. Um, what that means is that there's a lot of capital flight. And, and it is this capital flight uh, that the government has tried to control and has thereby also tried to control inflation. And so it's, it's rather complicated, but um, um, I mean, that's, that's really at the but heart some, of it. Some of the other countries that have perhaps not as much as a resource-based economy like Bolivia, but certainly natural gas in Bolivia is, I guess, their main source of revenue, I would think, yes. other than coca. And uh, they, their inflation is very low. Uh, right. Ecuador, oil and natural gas, and, and mm -hmm. do not have the same runaway inflation problem. Why is it such a problem in Venezuela and not in those countries? I think uh, the reason for why in Venezuela it's a problem has to do, uh, again, with the historical difference between, or the difference between Venezuela and Bolivia, which is that Venezuela has taken a more radical approach towards the economy. That is, um, when, uh, when Chavez first uh, tried to institute many of the reforms that he instituted, um, it provoked a coup attempt. And it was this coup attempt that in turn provoked a massive capital flight. And, uh, and it is this capital flight that the government tried to get in under control through a uh, Just to be clear to everybody, control. capital flight meaning people with money sending up to Florida or wherever. Right. Yeah. And, the, and uh, the government at that time uh, had the, was faced with a choice, either try to intervene in the currency market and lose its hard currency, that is its dollars, uh, dollar reserves, or let the currency basically go to hell that is uh, completely, uh, you know, become completely devalued because all of the uh, uh, money was being taken out of the country and thereby the currency So used foreign like reserves to, to, to buy bolivars right. which would stabilize it except you're using up your foreign reserves. Exactly. But they, that's what they were doing until they established a currency control in 2003. And uh, this currency control has been in existence since that time until uh, the present period. So why didn't it work? Years. What, explain it clearly what the control was and then why, why didn't it work? Well the control was basically that you could only exchange money through the government under a pr certain pre-established approved rules. Uh, that is only for certain per types of purchases, like if you're traveling or if you want to import certain uh, goods that are needed within the country, or if you need to pay off foreign debts or something like that. And it was, there was a whole list of things for which you could request dollars. So if you want to dollars. buy American dollars, you have to come go within that criteria or you're not allowed right. to buy American dollars through the banks. Exactly. So instead you go to the black market. Exactly. So there was a black market from the start already. Uh, but the black market at, in the beginning wasn't um, that much different from the official exchange rate. It might have been 50% uh, more expensive to buy uh, dollars on the black market than it would have been through the government. Yeah, so in other words, if you didn't have uh, the, 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 the reasons for buying dollars that, that you needed, you could go to the black market, which was illegal, but uh, something that everybody knew how to do, or most people knew, know how to do, and therefore uh, it, it, was, you know, it was almost impossible to prevent. Um, but uh, the real problem was that uh, with, uh, over time, inflation continued to essentially devalue the currency within the country, but it was this, uh, the exchange rate wasn't really, uh, wasn't rarely adjusted to the outside world. So uh, in other words, the, cu uh, the currency became overvalued. Uh, and that meant that the gap between the exchange rate, the official exchange rate, and the black market exchange rate became ever wider. And when you have a widening gap between two different exchange rates, people start to take advantage of that through what's known as arbitrage. That is, they buy the currency, the dollars, at a very low price, and then turn around and sell it on the black market for a very high price and make a hefty profit. In the beginning, it wasn't really worth it because you could you know, buy it uh, you know, for two bolivars, you could buy a dollar and then sell it again for three. So you'd have a 50% uh, uh, 
uh, profit margin, but considering the complications involved uh, and uh, the limitations, it wasn't always worth it. But as that gap got larger, and now it is a factor of 10 to 1, that is, you know, you, could, uh, you, need, you can buy a dollar uh, for, let's say, six bolivars and sell it for 60, that is a tremendous temptation. So anybody, for example, who gets uh, bolivars to, to... Sell it for 60 to the official bank. No, no, you sell it on the, on the black market to whoever wants dollars where in you the black buy market. Where do you buy it from? You buy it from the government. They right, buy the, the government, because the government is, exactly. is saying the boulevard is really worth that much, that much more than the right. black market says exactly. it's worth. Exactly. Right. So, but that, of course, requires that you have access to it. Who has access to those official exchange rate dollars? Well, basically, people mostly from the middle class who can say that they need it for travel, um, that they you know, have a plane ticket, uh, or people who uh, say that they're going to import something. And so then uh, those two sectors, really, they're really the main beneficiaries of the official exchange rate. Most of them don't actually use it for travel. They just uh, may, they might travel and then quickly sell the dollars that they got. I mean, uh, that is, get the dollars that they got and return to the country and sell them within Venezuela at a, a ten, uh, one thousand percent profit margin. Or the people who import, let's say, some essential good, let's say you know cornmeal or whatever or milk, uh, turn around and export that same milk uh, to Colombia and sell it there and get the dollars again. Um, and sell the dollars within Venezuela at a, ten, uh, t a factor of 10 uh, profit margin. So um, that's when it becomes a real problem, and that's what's currently happening. It also explains the shortages. People are importing things that get smuggled out of the country right away because it's so much more lucrative to sell them out of, outside of the country than within the country. So you get a lot of dollars chasing too few goods. Um, well, not dollars, a lot of bolivars. Oh, bolivars. Oh. <laughs> right. A lot of boulevards That's, chasing too few goods. Yes, essentially. So, so what is the government going to do about it? What are the proposals on the table? That's the thing. I mean, the government has been relatively, I would say, slow in reacting to this problem. That is, uh, more and more they've realized that this is a serious problem. As a matter of fact, Maduro recently announced that uh, up to 30 to 40 percent of the uh, products that are imported with uh, goods, uh, dollars that were uh, obtained through the official exchange rate mechanism, up to 30 to 40 percent of those dollars actually, or imports actually, uh, get exported through smuggling right away. Uh, so it's 30 complete, to 40 percent. Yeah, so it's an enormous number. And we're talking tens of billions of dollars that uh, are basically being wasted on this currency control right now. And so the government has realized this cannot continue. And as a matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, and this got completely lost in the news actually, um, is uh, with the protests that uh, uh, the, the um, vice president for economic affairs, which is the, also the president of uh, the oil industry, uh, Rafael Ramirez, made a, a very important announcement that they were going to allow um, a, basically an open free-floating currency market again in Venezuela. That is, there are going to be two exchange rates. One uh, is going to be still the official exchange rate for under those certain circumstances. Which is fixed. Which is fixed and uh, in order to keep inflation down. That is, if you import something, it's going to be relatively cheap to sell it in Venezuela. Uh, however, uh, there's also going to be a parallel exchange rate that would um, essentially uh, be floating, although the government will intervene in, in that market. Um, has anyone done this before? Anywhere? To, to have two exchange rates? Uh, yeah, well, it has existed in Venezuela before, actually, and uh, it has, uh, uh, there ha I mean, the Colomb uh, Cuban government also has something similar in a sense, although not a floating exchange rate, but has also a varying uh, a dual exchange rates. So that, that certainly there is precedent for that. The problem is it doesn't really eliminate the problem of what I mentioned before of the arbitrage. If the gap is too large, it creates this tremendous incentives for smuggling and for trying to beat the system in one way or another. So what is the solution? The, uh, well, there's uh, several arguments. I mean, on the one hand, the government doesn't really b want to give in completely to the capital markets and say we're going to let the currency float. Why? Um, because they're afraid of the capital flight. Um, so they want to give, and also of inflation. They're afraid that it will heat up inflation even more. Um, so that's why they're resistant to completely letting it float. But that's what uh, many people argue is, would be the solution, to let it float, or at least not completely to let it uh, uh, float within certain uh, but, bandwidth. But the capital so flight, can. again, this is people taking their money out of the country, uh, you need to really have any serious capital flight, you need to be able to convert it to dollars, because you're not going to run with bolivars. Of course. So if they make it very difficult to convert, then how much capital flight can there be? 
Well, it's not, uh, the thing is you cannot control capital, uh, uh, the conversion, because what you could do is very easily oh, just... Because they can do it on the black market. You, yeah, on the black market, exactly. Uh, and the black market, you, people always have this idea that there would be international bank transfers, but that's not even necessary. You can just have a friend transfer uh, money from one account to another, and then you transfer it from their, your account to somebody else's account, and that's kind of, even though it's not a direct uh, uh, transaction that crosses borders, it still does uh, have an effect on the black market value. Of, uh, of the so currency. go back then. Why not? Then what's the argument against the floating rate? Then? Well, the government's uh, argument mainly is that um, that it yeah it would heat up inflation too much. Um, essentially, because uh, you know, if the currency becomes too devalued, imports become much more expensive. Uh, that's one major problem. The other problem is, uh, yeah, the value of the currency is uh, is also something they want to maintain it's in order for Venezuelans to buy, to travel abroad, and to to buy things abroad. I mean, is part of the problem that Venezuela is still too much of an oil economy that is too dependent on imports for too many things? I mean, yes. if more of this was produced in Venezuela, it'd be far less of an issue. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's that's. Uh, uh, that's the heart of the problem, but on the other hand, um, th the government is trying to wean itself away from oil, pr uh, oil dependency by investing its uh, oil revenues within the uh, Venezuelan economy and other uh, sectors, but that's not really working because uh, these sectors are nowhere near as uh, profitable uh, and productive as the oil sector, and therefore it's, it's, just a, it's almost like a, um, um, a, a vicious cycle, really. Uh, they, that they can't seem to get out of, at least not using the oil money. Okay, we'll unravel this more <laughs> again later. It's, it's, it's complicated, but clearer, clearer than it was 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.